started. So I am Jillian Hayes. I'm the faculty director here for the Masters in Human Computer Interaction and Design. And I am so excited to welcome you to our second annual UX Career Conference. And um, we've been having a great time planning this, growing this. We're gonna, from the looks of things, we're gonna have to find a bigger venue next year. So that's really great news. Um, I'm super happy to welcome lots of professionals from the area and in fact lots of people who flew in um, just for this event. So we're glad to have you. And then of course also our wonderful MHCID students and alumni um, and students who will become alumni tomorrow, which this day is really about celebrating. Um, so with that, we are going to go ahead and get started. So just a reminder for the day, we have two keynote speakers bookending our student presentations. Uh, and then following that, we'll have a little bit more networking time. You guys can talk some more amongst yourselves and so on. For those of you who didn't find them already, exits at various sides of the room, uh, restrooms behind the folding panels, so you know where everything is for the day. All right. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to hear from Allie Hall. She is the president of Allie Hall and Associates. She does, uh, they, their group does a series of work around executive coaching, uh, leadership development, corporate retreats, corporate strategy planning, and so on. And so for many of us, we spend so much time being so tactical in our user experience. We're spending our time doing our research, doing design work, all of these other things. Sometimes we can forget about the important work of leadership and leadership training. So we've asked Allie to come and talk to you today about that kind of leadership training, and particularly around the next generation of leaders. So many of you are going to be in that next generation of leaders, and many of you are looking to train and hire those people today. So with that, I want to invite Allie to come up and join us. And 
the generations say different things. So I'm also going to share with you like the kinds of questions that I ask and what they what what they tell me. Um, so. This, yeah. So the first thing that I learned from the millennials uh, is that CEO stands for Chief Empowerment Officer. Chief Empower or Chief Enabler. Chief Enabler which was quite a different story from the world I came from. The professional service firm where sort of, you know, I told you what to do. Or there's a problem, let's build a team. And now on the team, you do this, you do this, you do this, and come back and tell me what's happening. This is from the book, How Google Works. Um, and in that book, they tell the story of Larry Page on a, on a Friday night, you know, running a, running a um, a search, and you can see here the search is hairdresser in London, and the ad that comes up is motorcycle hire in London, right? And he's just like, does he build a team? Does he sign roles? Does he do that? No, he like hangs this on a bulletin board and writes, these ads suck. And by the next day, it's fixed. By the next day, it's fixed. And the story he's telling is like, if you just hire the right people, you get people who know why they're working here, or what they want to be doing, and you say, like, find the problems you want to solve, figure out what's interesting to you, that you don't need to sort of lead by execution. Uh, obviously, we need to execute, but that your job in leadership is to, is to empower and enable others to do things. Um, and, and Deloitte's done quite a lot of studies on millennials and why do they leave, and um, one in four say they're leaving because they're not getting the opportunity to run with whatever it is they run with. Um, and so the organizations that I consult to now, so with the, you know, I'll say, you've got a group of people that want to do something or someone that wants to do something, give them permission, always give them permission to be doing what they want to be doing, to find their, their flow, to find that place where they're engaged, you know, working hard, like loving what they do. You have, to, you have to move people into that space and always be asking them, what do you want to do? You know, so many of the kinds of performance conversations we have with people are about, how's this going, how's that going? And I'm sort of saying to them, what motivates you? Why do you work here? What, what are the bits of your job that you want to be doing? It's starting with that question instead of telling people what to do. Uh, the next lesson I've learned is adhocracy, not bureaucracy. And one of the questions that I ask when I do the, the breakouts that I was telling you about um, is what are your views on leadership and hierarchy? And I ask the question just like that. What are your views on leadership and hierarchy? The baby boomers and Generation X, my generation, we conflate the two. We come back with an answer that tells you about hierarchical structures and where leadership sits in them. The millennials answer the question, oh, you asked me two questions. Hierarchy is this and leadership is this. And let's, let's answer the two questions. So some of that comes from like the history. So for the baby boomers, so you're born between 1946 and 1964 roughly, baby boomers grew up in a time of transactional leadership, right? Like there was a trade. Like I'll do this and I'll be promoted that way. And I'll do this and I'll be promoted that way. And I'll, you know, pay my dues, corporate ladder, all this. That was the way it was. So they can play the two because they say, well, look, we're not like the old, you know, kind of, silent generation, World War II generation, but we are the generation that, that understands there's a, there's a trade to be made and that you, you move into these positions over time. We get to my generation and the, the leadership literature changed. So we started talking about charismatic leadership. We started talking about trait theory and we started talking about visionary leaders, leaders that really said where we were going. This is like 1986, that word starts to appear in the leadership leader, literature, visionary. So our generation will say, well, yeah, we, we understand about hierarchy and, and all that, but you know, you had to earn your right to be there. It wasn't just because you spent your time, but you, you know, you deserve to be there. We like role models that we can follow. They have a vision for us. Enter the millennials, distributed leadership. Lead from any chair. Leadership is everywhere, right? I can lead on anything I want to lead. 
even back to that Deloitte study I was talking about, they, people are leaving because they're not getting those leadership opportunities. So in organizations, we have to create or allow the space for anybody to lead on anything they want to lead. Leadership is a much more um, dispersed and shared, distributed uh, idea. And the millennials will say, and hierarchy, forget it. Like, it's the enemy of innovation. It's the enemy of agility. It's the enemy of speed. We need to just be agile and adaptable in whatever we need to do in the moment. That was my, my second learning from your generation. The next question I ask is, how do you feel about feedback? The baby boomers usually don't even answer the question. Like, they just skip it as if I didn't ask it. It's so bizarre. I start to say, so what you guys thought? Was that up there? Like, they don't even see the question. And then Gen X, my generation, the neurotic generation, we're just like, just give it to me fast and make me better. Like, the world is an uncertain place and I need my job. And it's really bizarre, like this really kind of, and then the millennials, oh, we love feedback. We want it all the time. Like they'll just draw hearts on their flip charts about how they feel about feedback. So I start to talk about what happened in our childhoods. Feedback was not a thing for the baby boomers. Like they didn't get it at work. There was like a once a year performance review, maybe, maybe. And for Gen Xers, it was really like, I just, the world is a tough place. Think about how, how the baby boomers grew up, right? Time with lots of change. Baby boomers are called baby boomers because they're a massive generation. There's lots of opportunity and prosperity. And, and, and that was what the world looked like. For the, for the Gen Xers, it's like Reagan years, Thatcher years, like very small generation. Generation X is the smallest actual generation in terms of numbers. Um, and that happens when, um, when the economy is not doing well, people have less children. So lots of children during baby boom generation, less for Gen X, loads of children in the millennials, less for Gen Z, which I'll talk about at the end. So the baby, the, the, the Gen Xers are just quite insecure. As a generation, it was a tough time. Our parents said, grow up, get a job. Millennials, your parents said, grow up, be happy. <laughs> Find your thing. <laughs> Our parents were like, no, no, <laughs> get a job. <laughs> now, Gen Z is looking a little more like that, actually. Grow up, get a job. I'll talk about that. But, but so our generation really was just like feedback just to make us better. Your generation, change in the pedagogy and a change in the way you're raised. A proliferation of parenting books. Not all of your millennials, I don't mean that, but a lot of you look really young. <laughs> Um, the, 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 the world was different about how we raised you. So we were telling you lots of things about how you were doing. Teachers were marking your papers more writing than you wrote on the paper itself. Whereas the generations before, just a letter, just a grade. So you grow up with getting all this feedback, and then you come into the workplace, and you're working with a whole bunch of people who are just like, why do they need so much feedback? And we're not really well trained in how to give it. So I kind of draw this. Um, this curve of what happens when we give you feedback, or, or anyone gets feedback, and, and it's a bit of neuroscience, right? It's a bit of like fight, flight, freeze, response, like you're attacking me, oh, first thing that happens, shock, anger, right? And then we go to denial, blame, wait a minute, it's not fair, he did that too, she did that too, why me? I'm gonna quit. And then you can start to move into, oh, maybe I understand a bit of that feedback, and now let's start to solve the problem. But unless people get really good at creating cultures of continuous feedback. Cultures where we have, maybe some of you have read Kim Scott's book on radical candor. Cultures where we're talking about clear and direct communication about how you're doing, paired with, I do care. I do, I do care about who you are. Not what she calls obnoxious aggression, which is clear and direct with no care and, 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 and not, not knowing you at all as a person. Although, I should say, she says, and I agree, obnoxious aggression, while not as good as radical candor, is preferable to ruinous empathy. Which is like, oh, but you're so wonderful. You're so wonderful. And how you did this was so wonderful. I did that was so wonderful. You kind of screwed this up, but you're so wonderful. I call that the shit sandwich. <laughs> I remember, like, you're so good. <laughs> no, you're really good. Did you hear that <laughs> We don't want to do that either, right? Or you can go into, um, Manipulative insincerity, where we don't tell you anything. But in order to have a pro 
productive, engaged workforce where people feel that they are growing, learning, developing, becoming their best selves, and being in that state of flow, what Martin Seligman talks about, about flow, I'm engaged, I'm having positive emotions, I have good relationships. You have to have a culture where you have clear and direct communication about how you're doing. I care about you, let's talk about how you're doing. And the millennials want this all the time, and for the other generations, it's really hard to learn how to do it, because we just didn't get it. But don't worry, lots of us are out there teaching people how to give good feedback, so we're working on changing it. The next lesson I learned from this generation, Generation Y wants to know why. Why, why, why? Which started my kind of like high maintenance millennials talk. Like, oh, they just come into my office and it's like, why, why, why? Because why matters? So this is Simon Sinek's Golden Circle. I don't know if any of you have watched his TED Talk. It's quite old now, but it's a really good one. And he just talks about, like, so many of us talk about what we do. Or they talk about how we do it. But the most important thing is you know why we do what we do. And, and I think he, maybe he or someone else gives the example of Disney World. As a, or Disney, and we can talk about Disney on another level another time, but for now let's talk about this aspect of Disney, which is why Disney exists is to make people happy. That's what they say their core purpose is. We exist to make people happy. Now we could say, what does Disney do? Oh, they have characters, or they have theme parks, or they make movies, or whatever. We could say what they do, or how they do it, right? By drawing, or by, we could talk about that. Um, but if we know why they do what they do, they can do anything. So Disney now teaches English to Chinese children online through princesses, or princes, right? So they're finding these Disney characters that the children love to engage with, and it makes the children happy. So we can be in any business we want to be as long as we're adhering to our core purpose, as long as we know why we do what we do. Um, so. One of the things that we do with organizations is walk in and say, um, it's, it's part of um, Jim Collins' good to great stuff where you know you ask why on five levels. What do we do? Why is that important? And you answer that question, then you ask again, and why is that important? And you ask again, and why is that important? You do it five levels. So you get to this core purpose. And to engage your workforce, to really have people who know why they're there, know why they're giving you that discretionary effort, know why they're putting so much into it, it's because they know why we're doing what we're doing. And we are aligned with that. You have to be aligned with your organization's core purpose, why we do what we do. I mean, I told you that I was a lawyer and I still work with law firms from time to time. And one of the law firms I work with in the UK is an offshore law firm. And I was like, so why do we do what we do? <laughs> and how are we engaging with that? But it was a really important question. And, and you can have opinions about that. You can have opinions about why these, these kinds of vehicles exist for organizations. But if you're not aligned with it, and you don't believe in it, then you, you can't work in that structure. So helping people to, to really understand why we're here and why, and it also liberates you to try experimenting to try innovating as long as it's consistent with the why we do what we do, the opportunities for innovation and engagement are endless for organizations. Okay, the next, the next lesson I learned. Meaning is the new money. Now, you have to have money. <laughs> but, you, but, but there's a lot written about, there's a, there's a very interesting book called Punished by Rewards, and it talks a lot about how people need to make enough they need to make enough to feel the trade was worth it. I, I have to feel that the bargain that I, the deal I struck was good. But after that, it's something else. After that, there's another reason why I want to be here. Different from the core purpose of, of the organization. Now, I have Tom's, because you know they do the one for one. But you don't have to be an organization that's specifically set up for any sort of social purpose. Lots of organizations have, LinkedIn has like their in-service day, and Google has their famous 20% day, and
and lots of, of firms have corporate social responsibility initiatives or pro bono initiatives. But for organizations to listen to what else is driving you, because, because for so many of us now in this kind of boundary, boundaryless world we live in with technology, our lives have become more coherent. They've become more holistic. For the previous generations, my generation and older, we were very much like the end of the workday was the end of the workday and then you were doing life. Although we complain that you want more work-life balance than we wanted, or you're asking for it more than we were asking for it. But you were just asking for it differently. We didn't have the technology to stay connected all the time, so when you left, you left. And now you have the technology to stay connected all the time, so you're saying, look, I just don't have to be here right now in this way. But you're still saying, um, I need a more holistic view of how I make work and life fit together. So if we can find out all the things that have meaning to you and create space for that in your life, we can help you create a more holistic picture of who you are as a person and how work is part of your identity and part of what you, you need. And Nearly every organization I work with, including banks, insurance companies, law firms, and then the really cool tech firms that I work with, are creating space for you to talk about what else you need. And for so many of them, turning it into something that's um, marketable. Like um, Gore-Tex is a really great example of a company that doesn't do hierarchy and doesn't even do job titles. and like. All meetings are optional, and so if you're a leader and you're sort of like, well, I called a meeting and no one came, the answer is like, you're probably not a very good leader then, <laughs> like no one's following you. Um, but they, they do all of this stuff, like they really take this kind of stuff to heart. Um, and they were, you know, I, I love the story about this one guy who was like an avid guitar player and he was complaining about his strings and how they hurt in his hands, and he was like, yeah, that stuff we make live demo floss with, like, let's coat our guitar strings with it. Like, let me have that as a project. Nothing that Gore-Tex was into at all at the time, right? Now it's one of their biggest selling products, these strings that are coated in this poly whatever material it is to, to play guitar. So letting people find their meaning in an organization is hugely important to engagement. Okay, next thing I learned from the millennials. Whoever tries the most stuff wins. And, and this sort of famous quote by Edison, I have not failed, I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. This is really all about growth mindset. This is all about every time you want to say, I failed, say, I learned. And I was just coaching um, this um, chief product officer the other day on this, and she was just, I said, so how do you feel when you, you know, we were talking about this concept, and I said, well, how do you feel when, when you fail? And she says, well, um, I feel ashamed when I fail. She said, um, I, want my, I want my team to feel accountable for their failure. And I was like, so let's just, every, she had about six words, and I, six sentences, and I said, well, let's replace every word, every time you said failure, let's replace it with word learn. So then it was, I feel ashamed when I learn. Or I want to hold my team accountable for their learning. Right? Every time we replace failure with learning, it was like, oh, there's an opportunity here. Oh, something happened here. But you have to give people the space to try. So the, the kind of um, older generation response of like, you know, just kind of like tiny risks and really, you know, thoughtful risks and um, it just doesn't work. I mean, it, it, and it doesn't empower people and it doesn't allow them to, to learn and grow. We're, we're rewarding effort. We're rewarding a different kind of learning, a different kind of engagement. Now you have to have good learning, like platforms, templates, whatever you want to call it. Like you have to actually create a culture where we're going to record the issue, we're going to say what happened, we're going to figure out where that is, we're going to, um, we're, we're, we're going to learn together. Um, in order to do the kinds of things that I've talked about today, so empowering people, breaking down hierarchies, giving real candid feedback, letting people try stuff, letting people experiment with what has meaning to them, you have to create a, what, what um, Bill Keegan and Lisa Leahy at Harvard call a deliberately developmental 
You have to create an organization or be part of an organization that says, we are here to help people develop deliberately. And in order to do that, you have to have community, <coughs> belonging. In order to become, you have to first belong. Because if you're feeling, oh, I don't know, I can't be vulnerable, and I can't show up, and everyone's judging me, and it's like a fixed mindset world, and I'll fail, and I'm, i got to go through these hoops, it's never going to have the like, sort of freedom to, to learn and become. Um, I don't know if any of you know this, this case study where Google looked at like teams and they tried to figure out like why are some teams more successful than others and they did this big analysis and anyway in the end was, was it was a decision right was it who was on the team was it having a head heterogeneous team or a homogeneous team what what was the thing and what they found was the thing was psychological safety the thing was having a team that felt connected we know each other we have each other's backs can share our vulnerabilities and our insecurities, tell each other when we're doing well, we appreciate, we recognize, we give candid feedback. In order to allow this culture to emerge, you have to create that on your team, in your organization, by sharing with each other, by trusting each other. And now this goes back to what I think the younger generations, well, your generation, and then I'll talk about Gen Z in a minute, but what your generation does so well, which is like, I, I, I know I go into these law firms and like, they, people my age, they're like, I don't want to be friends with these people. Why does everyone want to be friends at work? You know, and I'm like, okay, well maybe it's not about friends, but maybe it's about human connection. Maybe it's about a sense of community where you show up and you say, this is who I am. Like, I need you to see me. And then we can have the conversations about what we're trying to create what we stand for, what our values are, where our next opportunity is. But only when we've created that sense of community can we start to figure out what our groove is, what our flow is, and where our edge is, where we're going to innovate, where we're going to disrupt, where we're going to try something different. You have to have that space first. Um, so that's what I've learned from your generation. Now I'm going to talk to you about my daughter's generation. <laughs> Gen Z. So this is just a snapshot, early days. But um, as I said to you in the beginning, um, the, the millennials typically, obviously I'm generalizing, but typically millennials are the children of baby boomers. And both generations grew up in times of prosperity. I'm talking about pre-2008, I know the bubble crashed. And I'm not saying your whole life if you were a millennial was great, but a lot of your formative years, there was a lot of opportunity and you were a big generation, just like the baby boomers. Gen X, small generation, Cold War, tough times, latchkey kids, high divorce rates, Gen Z, similar. It's been a recession. It's been, um, a, it, in this country, a lot of um, uh, school shootings. That's the parkland image at the top. But, um, small generation, um, um, an anxiety written generation. The Snoopy, Charlie Brown, my anxieties have anxiety. So lots written about this generation feeling the anxiety. And if you ask these kids, there's lots of studies now on these kids, they're in college still, but what is the most important thing? They're saying the same thing my generation said, get a job. Now, it could be the economy, or it could be that we're their parents. <laughs> so we're just like, I don't care if you're happy, get a job. <laughs> this is a little more of that kind of parenting going on. You know, so they're much more socially, uh, sorry, fiscally conservative than the millennials. Uh, much more not wanting to spend money in the same way as millennials, like their Gen X parents, more conservative. But they're also, um, it's the rise of the micro-entrepreneur. So it's a, a BNP Paribas did a really cool study on millennials, and, and they wrote, they, they called it the rise of the millennialpreneur, and say how millennials are so entrepreneurial, you know? And it's because the barriers to entry are lower because of tech, but for these Gen Z, these kids are like little micro-entrepreneurs, like little businesses everywhere, like they're figuring out in a completely different way. The gig economy, right, is, 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 is what this generation is, is standing for. So, um, but their platform to be heard is massive. They understand how to use the technology in a way that's different, and they're, um, they're showing up in, in this way. They're, they're truly digital, 
They could never know the world. Like, this is a baby on an iPhone. She's probably doing something I don't know how to do. You know, like, they've never not known that world. And they actually find that, the, that, that, that it's so useful. And they want the boundaryless office, you know, in every way. So um, the millennials introduced the concept of, like, working from home or working wherever. However, what's been really interesting, um, one of the questions I ask is, do you like to work on teams? Or how do you feel about teamwork? And the baby boomers say, yeah, it's fine. Like, we love consensus. We're kind of the hippie generation. You know, we, we like to talk about things. Gen Xers are just like, oh, god, another meeting. All right, we're going to work on a team. This is my team. You do this. You do this. You do this. You do good team meeting. Great. Right? Very much like, how efficient can we be? And then the, the millennials came in and were like, oh, collaboration. Let's brainstorm together. Right? Let's talk. This generation wants to be left alone again. Getting back to a really independent generation, just like, let, let, let me work, let me work. And less team working now in schools, they still work in teams, but not to the same degree in, in the elementary schools as you were working in teams. Um, so it's really, you, we're really seeing organizations that are embracing this notion of freedom and flexibility in where and how you work. Um, uh, that is a K-pop boy band that my daughter loves. I can't name them, but she can name all of them. And I do actually think it's quite amazing, this world that we live in, that she knows K-pop. You know, from, actually from England, but still, like, there's the, way, the platform for everyone, this global world. So remember that the baby boomers wasn't much of the global world at all for when we, when, when in the 80s we started to introduce these concepts of diversity at work and whatever. For the millennials, they're like diversity, we get it, we know it, it's always been that way. This generation always been that way. And of course, the introduction of um, non-binary and, 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 and challenging, challenging norms, or what we thought were norms, in a completely different way. So, um, there's lots to look forward to <laughs> and lots to think about uh, as this generation enters the workforce. Okay, uh, I think I have five minutes and I, I covered a million concepts, I think, but I'd be very happy to answer any questions uh, if anybody has any. You know, you, you need to have built a relationship over time that is, like, I care about you. 
I care about your development. I want to tell you how, how well you did this. And, and to praise with as much specificity as you criticize. You know, we think so much before we give someone feedback. How am I going to say it? What about, let's rehearse it, let's role play it. I actually think you should do the same for praise. So that someone really knows what it is you've appreciated and recognized about them before they move into the, to the next bit. So just things you can set up ahead of time before that conversation. But if it's like you've never spoken before, bam, I'm going to give you some feedback. Yeah, you're going to be in that, you know, space for longer. And the curve, that curve, is, the bottom is time. So your question was absolutely like, how do I, how do I shorten that? You know, yeah, thank you. Yes. Then, then you have an alignment problem. <laughs> um, but you don't, but you may not yet know. So I actually, when I coach people, one of the first things I do when I coach them is I have them keep a, like a little diary of when they were full of energy during the day. When were you buzzing? You know, when were you just loving what you were doing? And when was like the life being sucked out of you as you sat at your desk or your whatever? Like notice, like you have to start helping people notice when they're engaged and when they're not engaged. When are you learning? When are you happy? When are you in flow? Um, and, and, and then we can start to look at what are the pieces of that that cause you to feel engaged. So was it, because you, usually it's, it's, you know, it's not just the, the actual technical thing they're doing, but it's kind of how they're doing it. I love solving this problem, or I loved just speaking one-on-one -on -one with someone, or I love being on a stage, or we have to find out and most people just don't notice. We just kind of go through life, like, I don't know, like, we just, we know, we just do things. But that, that kind of cultivating that sense of, like, self-awareness about what you love. So before getting to, like, oh, you're not a good fit, I would do, like, a lot of, like, you could do Myers-Briggs. There's free things online. You could do Barrett's Values Assessment. That's free online. You could just have them do the journaling, um, noticing when they're, Notice what's never on your list of things to do because you always just do it. Then we start to say, and where does that fit with an organizational need? Like, what, what do we need that we could try, you could try that would tick those boxes for you? So I would start with that before we, unless they say, like, I just don't like what you make or do or why you do what you do. Then they should definitely shouldn't work. All right, well, I think we'll wrap it up there. We can take a very short break just to allow the students to set up. Um, and if anyone needs to run to the restroom or anything like that. But thank you again, Allie. Thank you. Thank you.
no second. Uh, one's punch to him.
recurring client from last year, so we love them extra for that. Um, wow, and, and, and the team from last year is here to represent. They're excited. Um, all right, so thank you, and let you guys get started. Hello, everyone. Since I'm the first of the cohort to speak, I would love to welcome you, and thank you so much for sharing your Friday afternoon with us. Um, so I'd first like to start by introducing ourselves. Um, I'm Michelle Boyd, I'm currently a digital strategist for all of our common for mine. Hi, I'm Jennifer, I'm a UX designer at Nutribullet. I'm Sarah Murray, I'm a creative director in Portland, Oregon. I'm Dan Young, I'm a UX designer at SAP. Hi, I'm Amuja, I'm a UX designer at the group. So um, I'm sure I don't know if you point to the web extension, but um, they're a global uh, consultancy firm uh, based, uh, our mentors are based out of San um, Francisco. So let's begin. In April 2018, um, Julie Carpenter and Alex Cass, our mentors from Accenture, gave us a directive. They asked us um, a very open-ended question. How do we lower costs and improve efficiencies of cohabited environments by leveraging smart technologies? There were a couple of components of the directive that were really important for them. The first was to leverage smart technology that's already existing in the market. So they didn't want us to create a solution from the ground up. The other was that they're really, really focused on a future workplace or future workforce. And they're also really uh, focused on smart factories um, as a goal for Accenture and as like their innovative, um, innovative section of their um, workforce. So they really wanted us to figure out what are the ways to utilize this um, cohabited environment process to actually translate into other industries, like smart factories as well as the future workforce. So we decided, after a lot of primary research, that we were really interested in the assisted living space, primarily because it wasn't as crowded as the other spaces we were looking at, um, and also because of limited university resources. <laughs> so the very first, uh, so we just wanted to kind of run over the value proposition of the space. The very first is that the market space, the market size of um, assisted living facilities was $718 billion in 2014. And that's, that has only risen, or 2015, my apologies, and that's only uh, grown every, uh, every year by 6%. Um, the other number of staff is that um, there, is, there were uh, 30,200 assisted living facilities in 2014, and um, that too has uh, risen, um, and at that time it was holding uh, around 1 million residents. And lastly, um, there are expected to be 70 million adults over the age of 65 in 2030. So there's a huge shift in demographic population that's happening, and we thought this was a really great um, space to innovate in. So Dan will talk about um, which problems, uh, which problems we really focus on and prioritize in this space. So assisted living runs on very low margins. Um, so it's there's high pressure for efficiency and productivity, but it's very challenging because it's a service-based model focused on quality of care. We visited four field sites across Northern and Southern California and found these as the biggest pain points. Once a bed sore is developed, it's never cured. There are five stages to bed sores, with five being the most severe. Anything after stage two requires hospitalization and can be life-threatening. If a patient develops a bed sore, it's really, really painful. Oftentimes they can't sleep, and staff always has to visit them to help alleviate the pressure in the affected area. Another issue is tracking small valuable items, such as hearing aids. Um, imagine you misplaced or lost your phone, but now it's the size of a quarter. And then the color is beige, so it blends in with the environment. And it costs $5,000 so staff and uh, nurses have to spend hours looking for hearing aids, and this happens every single week. So there must be a better way to find them. Um, another issue is CNA turnover. CNAs are certified nursing assistants, and uh, it's a really tough job. They work long hours, low pay, physically and mentally demanding. Um, it's really stressful. A manager that we met, showed us like different ways she uses to show appreciation. And one way was um, writing the handwritten thank you notes just 
to show appreciation. So let me introduce you to the personas we developed from our research. Um, we have Luna, a CNA with over 16 years of experience. She's in her 40s, um, but she has a lot of low back pain and um, her body is physically uh, stressed because she's always helping her patients uh, relieve pressure from bed sores. And Lily is very ambitious, she's young, She's using the CNA experience to become an RN. She loves talking to seniors, but it's very tough because she doesn't. She spends most of her time uh, doing paperwork and looking for hearing aids. So, looking at this environment where the workforce is really being challenged to be more effective, more productive, and the value is actually in interaction and connecting with residents with a high stakes investment model. We developed a smart care platform that really focused on those frontline caregivers. We wanted to use smart technologies that assisted them in their tasks day to day so they could spend more of their time and energy focusing on the residents and feel supported in their work environment. We used Alexa because it is open platform and highly relevant to our client, Accenture. And it allows for hands-free operation of the different elements the multi-user recognition, recognition through voice accommodates an environment when you have multiple users coming in and out of the space and high staff turnover. So our assistant is based on two primary elements. The Alexa Echo Show has a monitor that allows display to the resident in the resident room while controlling other elements of the system. And the watch moves with the CNA around the facility so they're able to communicate and control remotely as they go through their shift. The smart bed is built with multiple features that help control for those factors of uh, bed sore prevention, prevention and fall risk, as well as operating the tracking feature for high cost equipment. So that first component is the smart bed. As we were tasked by Accenture to use existing technologies, technologies we came across multiple features that really could assist the caregiver, especially if operated hands-free in this environment. The first of those is a multi-chambered pressure-controlled mattress cover. These already exist, but are not currently integrated to larger systems. And by integrating it with our Alexa platform, it can be timed as well as controlled as the day progresses, conditions change, and the CNA has multiple demands on their time. Imagine you're going around your shift, you need to turn your patient every two hours, an interruption occurs, you might be moved back an hour, two hours, three hours, and then a bed sore may have started to develop. The second element is a moisture and moisture detection element that can tell when a resident who might not remember they can get out of bed, who might not be compliant with not getting out of bed, has a fall risk scenario and staff need to be alerted if this person is getting out of bed and putting themselves at risk. The moisture detection really helps prevent bed sores from developing in a second way because the elder skin is very, very delicate and if somebody has an incontinence issue during the night, they're sleeping, no one is alerted, you need to find out that this has happened right away and address the issue quickly. Finally, the bed controls allow the CNA to assist the resident as if they had a second person helping them by controlling the bed's height and position as they move residents in and out of the bed. So the great thing about the Alexa platform is it allows for you to create private skills so that businesses can actually control access. One of the things that we wanted to work with is the Alexa uh, Smart Watch app, which is actually in development. So the things that we'll show you are actually just a uh, concept for us that uh, should make it to the Smart Watch. Um, and an advantage to the Smart Watch is that users can actually move around the facility and take notes or, or make comments, uh, set up to-do lists, uh, hands-free, so they don't have to carry around paper and pen. Alexa, to-do list. What's the to-do? Give Rose her hearing aid tomorrow. Give Rose her hearing aid tomorrow. Add it to your to-do list. Alexa, what's on my to-do list? You have two items on your to-do list. Give Rose her hearing aid tomorrow and check on Rose's medication at 5 p.m. today. So the idea would be to uh, for the CNA to actually surface that to-do list on their smartphone. 
right? And they, they're able to check it off. And the great thing is it's also synced to the calendar, so they can see what's going on that day. Uh, another scenario that we ran into with uh, one of the CNAs that we interviewed uh, told us about a time when the resident actually fell on him. So he actually, actually had to keep her up until help came, and it actually took several minutes to do so. So how do you call for help without alarming the other resident? Right? So it could be very alarming for them. Uh, so we developed a, an alert. So the idea would be uh, for staff to receive this message on their own smartwatch. And again, because it's a uh, smartwatch, there's haptic feedback. So then they can actually get notified right away with these types of uh, level of alertness, right? So then they can actually go and help out uh, the resident uh, or the uh, CNA, again, without alarming the other resident. As Jen mentioned before, uh, CNAs spend a lot of time looking for uh, valuable items and uh, imagine, as she mentioned, uh, imagine something as small as a dime. It could take you hours to look for it. So imagine that this was a room of a resident in an assisted living facility and a resident, Rose, has lost her hearing aid. Luna, the caregiver, receives an alert saying, uh, look for Rose's hearing aid. So how does Bluetooth technology help you? Uh, we spoke with a company, a startup company in Santa Barbara called Tracker, and they uh, build Bluetooth-enabled devices which help people track the valuable items. So this is an item, uh, this is an app which has been developed by them, and I'll be using this to find a hearing aid which is actually lost here in a room. which will let the CNA know <laughs> So this app has a distance indicator which will let the CNA know how far or close they are from the lost item. As you heard, the beeping sounds and the lights will also help them look for the items which are maybe hidden in the dark. Our customized solution is uh, to place Bluetooth access points in every resident's room, and with the help of Wi-Fi, the CNAs will be able to locate the accurate position of the lost item. Thank you, Anita. So I'm going to bring this home again. Um, out of our process emerged many design principles that we thought were cross-applicable across industry. Um, and the ones that I wanted to cover briefly were allow for silence, and recognizing the level of severity. When you're in an environment that's so high stakes as an assisted living facility, where somebody could um, need an ambulance at any moment, um, it's really important for systems to be able to adapt really quickly, um, have a robust feedback mechanism for silence, because we have users that aren't able to articulate um, kind of consistently, um, and may have different ways of speaking to a device. So it's really important uh, for us to really focus moving in, um, moving forward and innovating in this space and innovating um, voice UI specifically to think about what silence means when you're trying to add, assess the fluidity of a conversation and how we can actually implement that into voice UI technology. And the other thing is, how do we create a metric for a, severe, a severity metric to um, provide a mechanism for the user so that we can distinguish when we get a call for help. But we know when that call for help is for water versus, hey, I've fallen down and I literally need help right this minute. So how does that system actually accelerate the request for help immediately to human feedback versus just saying, hey, help is on its way? Lastly, I would like to close with notes on how we see, if we were to continue working on this, and we had a lot of that time to think about this, how we would like to proceed with our uh, process. Um, on the field, we have the opportunity to speak to so many CNAs. We, 
go to directors of assisted living facilities. And we realized how burdened, how emotionally burdened these almost invisible workers are. And it's really, really critical moving forward that these people be heard and emotionally supported um, and improve their quality of life. So it's really important if we were to actually get an opportunity to continue, it would be great if we could integrate an emotional support system into the model where a caregiver or a CNA can come back and say, hey, I just lost um, a resident today and I really need to unburden or unpack my burden right now. The other thing we would ask for is can we put this in the field and research how this actually resonates in, uh, in location with all of the movement and all of the intense uh, necessities of um, the actual field and how people interact. Uh, so in situ testing would definitely be a next step. The other would be to figure out which industry regulations we would be trampling upon or having to work with. Because um, voice UI technology um, is currently not HIPAA compliant, but there are ways of um, increasing adoption by um, uh, including consent in the whole process. Um, the other is uh, cost analysis. Um, it would be very, very um, useless if this whole thing ends up costing more in training. So we wanted to set up a system that was easy to adapt and very cheap to Im implement. However, we would only know once we actually run all the numbers if this is an actually feasible um, solution. So thank you so much for your time. We would love to open the room for questions you may have. questions and know that we do appreciate the sponsor they're just not here. <laughs> questions for this group? Nothing. Well I have a question for you guys actually. Um, so I think one of the things that I think is really interesting about this work is all of the different stakeholders in terms of who pays for the innovation um, in these spaces. So can you guys speak a little bit to how you might imagine this if you were to create a new startup um, that how you might imagine funding was who your customers would be, et cetera. Yeah, uh, something that came up in our research was the requirements for compliance with uh, no return hospitalizations for this type of facility. Um, there's really high standards for not returning to hospitals for anybody who has been hospitalized and goes to this type of facility. So there's really a direct correlation between cost benefit of a system that's being adopted and the requirements of insurance. Accenture earlier, I think the throwing me off of them not being here. Uh, but the M Signia company is doing some really exciting, interesting work in sort of cybersecurity and payments methods. Um, and we have them here with us um, to represent today. And we're going to have Francis kick it off for this team. Thank you. Thank you. Is this going to be okay? I don't know. Okay. Let's hope for the best. <laughs> Okay, hi everyone. Thank you very much for being here. We are very happy to present our capstone project um, that we worked on for our client, Amicidia. And I start with a question, fact or fiction? For those of you wondering what fact stands for, that stands for frictionless authentication of consumer transactions. This is our team across four time zones. I'm Francis. Gilbert. Paul. And we start with our client Msignia. Paul Miller here representing our client. Msignia offers a best in class frictionless mobile authentication and user device recognition solution. 
MCGNI also has a patent and privacy compliant digital biometric technology, which collects and validates data point on users' devices, which results in a seamless user experience, uh, browser access, and mobile apps. What makes them special? Digital biometrics, EM vehicle, 3 d secure technology, privacy, and mobile first. And six months ago, our client, Paul Miller, uh, came here, we met with him, and his ask to us was to provide a best practices, white paper to the industry body, EM Vico, that reinforces the value of good user experience. And we map and, and define our project goal, which in a nutshell is to create such a recommendations document for mobile user experience around requesting permissions and sharing data. But before we jump into the client's goals and, and the project goal, uh, we have to talk about the foundation of our entire project, and that's data. And data is so valuable that it has become the new oil and currency. And we can talk about data in several contexts. Data has been shared, and all of us here at one point have given permissions in our phones, apps, websites. Data has been mined. Of, I'm sure everyone heard here of Cambridge Analytica and through Facebook earlier this year, and most recently, uh, Trend Micro. Data has been breached, Equifax, Reddit, MyFitnessPal, to name a few. And last but not least, regulated. GDPR in Europe, back in May, and most recently here in California, the California Consumer Privacy Act of 2018. And having talked about data and our client's goals, the project goal, we thought about the methodology. How, what's going to guide us? What framework? And we thought about design thinking. But that, that was not enough. We felt like we had to take a step back. And that's why we defined something that we call this exploration phase. That is, let's take a step back. Let's understand the technology. Let's understand the field. And what's the literature out there? What's the work that has been done in that area? to then go into uh, user research, gathering all of this information, coming up with ideas that at one point would be translated into prototypes and testing with users. And again, during the exploration phase, we just couldn't just jump into this uh, research, academic research, without some guidance. So we put these five questions together to help us guide us through the, this uh, academic research and putting all of that together. The first two questions, there entirely tied to our client's goals. At what point should we ask for user permissions? And the second one, what's the best experience to ask for permissions? The other three questions, how do concurrent users manage passwords, permissions, and privacy? How to inform users what data has been shared? And how to give control to the user of what data has been shared? Those are more questions to help us guide us, give us insights, and supplemental material to help us frame the problem that we have to solve. And this is how we did it. Thank you. Thanks, Francis. Um, I do stutter a bit. Um, bear with me. I might take another minute or two, you know, Julian. I hope it's not a problem. Um, <laughs> if you've seen you know, the King's speech, I, I promise you not to swear as much. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, how we start with this first phase um, Francis Neon mentioned. So looking at what's been, what's been done already in the field, and we immediately found four main buckets. Permissions, um, and, and it, with a lot of um, uh, material out, out there, of course, we learned that a user will be asked around 475 permission requests in the lifetime of a phone. Um, it was also a bucket about privacy, in which we learned that 54% of the users decide not to I mean, install an app based I mean, on the info being asked by the app. Um, well, another big piece is how to and, and, and when to I mean, inform the users that the data is being shared. And finally, and the big bucket in the field is um, what is called privacy by design. Um, and specifically, in terms of, um, in terms of the respect to 
uh, users of privacy, which was a bit of, of the foundation for what Francis mentioned in terms of, uh, of the GDPR. Um, and academic research, hopefully we have to look at, at what had been done before, um, is, is the key to um, any you know, project in academia, or it should be at least. Um, there are, in which we again found three main areas. Um, one, you know, privacy uh, by uh, design as well. Um, how a user and, um, and one user trust an application, and also how a language affects, um, and by language I mean how an app asks for things affects a user's you know, behavior in terms of the use of that app. Um, continue with the space and, 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 and getting down of our I mean, academia ivory tower, we thought it, it, it would be nice to actually I mean, understand further our users and, and, and figure out what what were their motivations, um, what were their the thoughts, and what were they I mean, I mean, insights into how, how they think about, how they manage, how they trust um, uh, mobile financial applications um, as, um, as they go on the day to day. To do that, we had a survey of around 100 people in the US, all um, I mean, iOS users, um, and also conducted Ten semi-structured in-depth kind of interviews to I mean, get um, understand users' thoughts and appreciations on their um, on, I mean, on the financial transactions on a mobile device. Um, I mean, it's a busy uh, slide. I'll, I'll focus on a few things in a minute. Um, uh, these are the results of, of, of our survey, and mostly something uh, we uh, thought were um, um, uh, relevant, I guess, was that um, still today, 76% of users uh, believe that the banks and, and credit card apps on their phone will uh, provide the right level of, of security um, for the data. Um, and not even half of the users um, revisit or think of their user data, even when they read in the news, um, I mean, actions as, as the, fam as the Facebook um, you know, data mining, or even Equifax um, and data breach, um, basically telling us <coughs> what we in the industry, in I mean, academia, I think is horrendous, and, and the people will go you know, clamoring to Congress to ask for new laws. I mean, half of the people, I don't even care. Um, finally, and another, I guess, fun fact was that I mean, almost half of our survey users said that they understood how and, and what data was being shared with third parties from their phone. I challenge anybody here, except, I guess, you know, Paul and Jillian, to, um, to uh, tell me how your current applications are sharing your personal data um, with the third you know, party vendor. If you answer it right, I'll give you a cookie. <laughs> right. um, also, and, and on the finding of, of, of our research was, and, it, and this actually propelled a lot of what we did, um, was that 50% so that of, our, of, of our server our users wouldn't mind sharing information to make their information safer, all right? Um, which, which, you know, which we thought was, I mean, key to um, our project, of course. And what, and now they're telling us, yes, I am willing to give more if you give me a seamless transaction, right? And and that, and, and that for us was our kind um, aha moment, saying uh, there's a lot to be done here, and and. I'm sure you will know, continue in this path. Um, Magiberto will uh, continue. Thank you, Juan.
as you alluded to, um, we have a lot of valuable data from our existing research. The next phase was to find the right problem to solve. We synthesized user interviews um, to make sense of the over 130 data points that we collected from the 10 different users. The findings confirmed a lot of what was found in academic research. People use various methods uh, to manage their passwords, with people um, reusing passwords being the most common. 80% of participants believe the apps ask for permissions purely for targeting for targeted marketing. Location is the most cited permission, with 69 opting in. And lastly, most participants indicated that they prefer to know what permissions are required before installing an app or immediately after, before or immediately after. Afterwards, we put on our brainstorming caps uh, to aid in the innovation process. We took six problem statements uh, to derived, derived from synthesizing our data, and as a group, we generated over 30 ideas. We combined the best ideas and voted on the best solution that we felt addressed the user's concerns. The ideas were then sketched out on paper and shaped into a prototype that we felt we could test on users. Uh, Paul will provide additional context on this phase. Thanks, Roberto. So we developed uh, low fidelity prototypes to allow to focus on how and where you ask for permission. So we created two versions uh, for which the major differences were the location within an e-commerce application and how content was provided. Location gave the value add of an early exposure to the feature um, versus potentially higher adoption rates. Context was given uh, based on the location. Uh, for example, the order confirmation screen has a call to action for a faster checkout. We use similar principles of offering context and value as well as empowering the user by offering transparency. A clear and concise message can flip a push message to a pull message when you empower the user as their next action is self-initiated by virtue of them opting in on the screener page. Users proved our assumptions wrong by rejecting prototype B. They suggested that they wouldn't even see it because they closed their app as soon as they submit an order. So while 90% of users had concerns regarding sharing their contacts, the same percentage did opt in to all three permissions. These insights led to a second prototype round with a single version. Reducing clutter and providing limited distractions created a funnel effect where users were ushered through to make an informed decision to continue. This version fared much better during the testing due to the simpler approach. While nobody did use the additional context hidden by an accordion, they were aware of it and stated that it increased their trust in our application. So while contacts were made a sticking point, at this point we saw a 100% opt-in rate. Some interesting points that we identified through the uh, prototype testing includes the realization that users lose interest when asked for more than three permissions at once. Aligning the app's value with the request reduced the confusion. And finally, by contextualizing permission requests, we noticed a reduced friction throughout the flow. Francis will now cover our project's main takeaways. Thank you, Paul. So, what do we get out of this, right? So, our entire project, the learnings that we had with our project. So, the first one is the value proposition to consumers is about convenience. But there is a caveat. It's the ability to complete transactions with at least as much security as the existing methods, right? So, we were talking, Paul just described the e-commerce online shopping experience scenario. So we all know here the last two disruptions, the better. That's a bend cards. The second one, it's about context. So provide context to users in a concise manner. And we always, or at least in this case of this project, we found surprises, right? We uh, sometimes, as not in this case, we wouldn't call ourselves subject matter experts, but we're putting this together once we test with users uh, the message that we want to give or you want to test, you think that it's going to be easy and you always find surprises. 
uh, our understanding is different from user's understanding. The focus of our project, this is a very important point, was iOS in the United States. So of course, Android and other markets require further study. Turns out our exploration phase was about gap, it was a gap analysis. Our research built a large gap, but left, other, uh, left uh, others open. Uh, and that includes other questions that surfaced from there. And uh, we therefore, we designed our research to be repeatable, to allow comparative studies. And there is a, another point that I want to make, it's not here in this slide, but I think it's one of the most important things that we not only learn through this process, but to reinforce. We're all here, this is a human-computer interaction and design program. Uh, it's all about user-centered design. It's all about the users, users at the center of everything. And one of the things that we learn or reinforce the message to this process is, in some cases, instead of jumping straight to user research and collecting more empirical data, it's worth the time taking that step back and going through all of this literature and a lot of this information that is out there. In some of these cases, that can save you time, that can save you money, and in some cases, it may even influence the results that you may have from the problem that you are trying to solve. Thank you. Awesome, um, over happy hour cocktail conversation. <laughs> 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 
Ibu guru itu. Ya. Terima kasih. All right, next up we have the um, colorfully uniformed team Investa, uh, who are working with Core Logic. Core Logic is a massive global company, but for us here in Irvine, they're a little bit of a hometown hero because they do um, a lot of work here in, in Orange County. Um, and we're very glad to have them here as well. So great, thank you. We're the third and middle group, so I know like it's kind of a weird facing. Thank you everyone for being with us. We're really excited to talk to you. Uh, so we are Team Investa, and we're gonna be talking today about democratizing real estate investments. Uh, and we're presenting for all of you, as well as our client for Logic, Kathy, David, and Anne. Thank you for being with us today. Um, so let me quickly introduce the team. We've got Sharon, who's our dev lead, we have Amin, who is our UX researcher, Amit, our project manager, Amir, our UX designer, and myself, I am marketing and consumer strategy. And then of course, David, Kathy, and Anne, thank you for being here. Uh, let's jump right in. I'd like to introduce to Anne. Anne is in her early 50s, she's semi-retired, and two years ago, she made her first investment, um, she, she bought her first investment property as a way to make passive income to sort of leave something for her grandchildren. The second person I'm introducing you to is Paul. Paul lives right here in Irvine with his wife and two kids, and he loves his community so much. He actually feels that the reason he invests in real estate is because he really wants to build a neighborhood that people feel very passionate about living in. What do Anne and Paul have in common? Well, it's a great question in case you're wondering. They both invest in real estate as a way to support their families and grow their income. The thing about real estate investment is that it's actually a huge financial activity, to state the obvious. Nationwide, the average transaction value is $200,000. But if you were to take a step back and look at the global market, we're dealing with $8.5 trillion. That's a ton of zeros. But more importantly, and what we'll actually talk about a lot today, is that it's a highly complex investment decision that you have to make. Not only are you dealing with competition for limited inventory, you're oftentimes dealing with things that are outside your control, like natural disasters or vacancy rate. It's not for the faint of heart. But back to Anne and Paul. A few months ago, we interviewed them because we wanted to understand what is it like to invest in real estate? Is it easy to get the data you need to make a good decision? Um, is all the work worth it? Are you even making money for your families? And this is what they told us. These are real quotes from people we spoke with. Real estate investment is a hassle. It's confusing. It's very easy to get lost in millions of property. It's like looking for a needle in a haystack. These are real people we spoke with with real frustration. We talked to investors like Anne, Paul, but many others, and we asked them, what are the tools and resources that you use in making your decisions about real estate investment? And some common trends appeared. They mentioned using websites like Zillow or Redfin. But then others mentioned using Excel spreadsheets, like what you see here, to put together information that they scrape together from word of mouth, real estate brokers, forums, and any number of other sources to calculate important things for their real estate investment, such as KPIs, key performance metrics. One of the huge problems with these methods is that data can quickly become outdated in this rapidly changing world, so your investment is only as good as the data sources as pounding your decision making. Bad data, bad investment. There has to be a better way. And this is where the best real estate data company in the world comes into play. CoreLogic is a global leader of property data and analytics. And to give you an idea of what that really means in specific detail, let's look at the numbers. CoreLogic provides high quality information to more than 9,000 banks and lenders, over 300 Wall Street firms, over 925,000 real estate professionals. And importantly, CoreLogic has 4 billion properties, 4.5 billion properties rather, with a 99.5% accuracy rate. Simply put, CoreLogic equals trusted data. But what good is that data if you don't know what to do with it and you can't make sense of it? This was actually one of the questions that David and Kathy came to us at the start of the semester to answer. They asked, is there an opportunity for CoreLogic to apply high quality data and business intelligence to serving the real estate investment market? And can we, Team Investa, do it in a way that is easier, faster, and with better data than what is available already? Spoiler alert, we say yes. 
Here's a sneak peek at what we created, and Amir will actually walk us through the design in greater detail, but let me give you the high level to start. Number one, this is a software as a service, which means that it's designed for scale. CoreLogic already has a variety of world-renowned, highly used real estate data products that can plug directly into this system. Number two, it's fast, advanced, and personalizable, oriented towards search to really give users the control over how to manage and take control over the information that's in front of them. Third, is there's an easy to use dashboard so that whether you have a few minutes or a few hours, the information that is most important to your decision making is available to you. And then finally, speed is paramount. Everything is designed so that the fewest number of clicks will get you to where you need to go. We got to this solution through five-part research and design methodology. It included things like competitive research, surveys, user interviews, design sprint, and then user testing and iteration. To start, by looking at the competitive landscape, we really wanted to understand what was out there and what was missing so we could sneak our way in there. Uh, who here has heard of any number of the companies on this slide? Please raise your hand. Okay. So, if you're looking for a home to live in, if you're looking for a rental, there are a couple of companies on this slide that can hook you up, not a problem. But what we're dealing with is a very different kind of market and a very different kind of user. The information you need to know to make a responsible investment decision is different than what's available through these sites. We're looking for something that offers data and business intelligence paired with a beautiful and easy to use interface. To further deepen our knowledge, we went we administered surveys to a wide range of real estate investors. We learned two key things. Number one, and this should be no surprise, the number one thing that matters to real estate investors is their return on investment. You're doing it because you're trying to make money. I think we all understand that. And the second is that the investors we spoke with were primarily looking at investing in single family residences. So for the purposes of us identifying the scope of work, we're not dealing with commercial properties, we're not dealing with multi-family homes, we're specifically dealing with single family residents. That, as a core value, is what we want to bring out in our design. And the next, when we conducted the user interviews, that was really a chance to put specificity to sort of the concepts that we had researched. One really telling quote that came out of that process is what you see on the screen. Time is what I value most. Find me a way to save time, and I'll use it. So again, touching on speed as paramount, we knew that our goal and our job was to create a tool that would make the most of this precious resource, time. Once we wrapped our heads around the target user, the scope of the problem, and the solution, it was time to get designing. And this is actually, I think, this was one of the more fun highlights of our whole process. For a full day, the team here joined Kathy, David, and other stakeholders at CoreLogic's headquarters here in Irvine. And we spent the whole day brainstorming, sketching, discussing, and iterating. And it was from this full day design sprint that we got a really clear picture of what we needed to design and what we needed to do to get started with the prototype. So keep that prototype in mind, we will go deep on that. It's beautiful, and I'm very proud of it. Um, but once we have the prototype, it's time to bring it back to the users to really validate what we had designed to make sure it was really solving real pain points. So we did user testing, and we iterated from that. Now the design, and here I'm gonna pass it to Amir to talk about how it works in real life. All right, thank you. All right, so as you know, we went through multiple iterations of these designs by the end users. We gathered all our research together, and <clears throat> we put together a low fidelity wireframe and introduced it to the CoreLogic team first. And then from there, we moved forward and showed it to some of the end users, real life investors, professional investors, <coughs> casual investors as well. And what we got is that majority of professional investors like to come to their dashboard. They come to their portfolio maybe five to six times a day. And what we did with the dashboard is we, we uh, introduced high-level snapshots of their KPIs and what mattered to them most. And what they asked for is, yeah, so these KPIs are reflected on what? <coughs> so these KPIs are reflected on all our properties. And what we allow them to do is drill down into an individual property too and then change these KPIs to just that individual property. And then also, while they're here and creating criteria and they want to know what's the newest thing on the market, newest property on the market for them to purchase, we deliver that for them on the dashboard as well, showing them the, the newest properties that meet, meet their criteria, um, and then they could drill into that criteria immediately. We also create uh, this, we also 
greater visualization of financial trends. So that allows them to know where they are year, year after year, and then they can compare it to the previous year of where they were. So we're trying to create a roadmap to success for these investors. Another thing is we update um, the investor's opportunities. So I've talked about that earlier, um, in driving these uh, new properties to them without having them to go look for it. So the next critical step for investors is finding a property, searching for a property. So each investor had their own cognitive walkthrough of how they could find a property, right? And a lot of the steps were either they want to buy to flip, buy to rent, or buy to live, right? And then from there, we allow the investors <clears throat> to do this and configure their own search criteria with the core logic metadata that they have. So imagine having an application that you can monetize on subscription base and also on database and cross-sell the data. Another thing we allow them to do is to manage their existing criteria. So exist the criteria that they already have, they can edit them, delete them, they could print them or they could email them and share them with other investors that they currently work with. And here it is, um, it's a configuration page of um, the search criteria. So for each one, they allow them to uh, add a new criteria in here and create their own algorithm of what they're really looking for. And this step, in, as I compared it to MLS, it was about like 50 to 60% faster than what MLS had and the KPIs and the algorithms that you can build here, you won't find any other, any other application. And then from there, one of the most important things is the results and what they get. Right. And one of the things that everyone really loved the most is the criteria match of that search and criteria, of that criteria that you met. So we allow the users to see here uh, you have 80% criteria match and we color coordinate the, the search results to what the criteria is that they really want. So they know they could ignore whatever that's in yellow or red and really look for the things in green and that really streamlines the search for an investor if there's hundreds of properties. And not only did we do that, we brought in, so we color coded the criteria search and we also brought in what's happening in that marketplace. It's kind of hard to see here because of the lights, but we brought, we brought in different uh, KPIs in the market so they can know exactly what's going on in the market as well. And another thing we found really important is to timestamp our information to make sure it's relevant information so people know what they're looking at is the most relevant information. And another important thing that we introduced is the different views of the way you can look at detailed properties. So as a professional investor, uh, they're in MLS a lot, and they look at things in a detailed view like this. A uh, casual investor might be in Zillow, or they might be in Redfin, and they see card view. We allow them to see a card view. And then all these other applications had that map view, so we allow them to see that as well. And then most importantly, we brought the detail page for each of the properties. So once you're ready to look at a property, we, uh, here's the detail page. It's more of a comprehensive report. So one of, the, one of the most important things that we introduced is the core logic score of this, app, of this property. And we're saying, out of, and what, what this signifies, signifies is a very strong ROI opportunity or a hot rental market in the next five years. So you know as an investor that if you're making this decision, it's probably a really good decision that you're going to make. So what's the next decision that you're probably going to do if you're a real professional investor? You want to do an outreach. You want to reach out to the person that's either selling this property. You want to get more, or you want to get more information. Another thing that CoreLogic does that not, not a lot of other companies do is the way you could view the property. Either you get in the car in today's traditional way of getting in the car and wait for the open house, or even better, we'll show you in a photo way, see it in photos, a 3D model of the property, a curb view, map view, or even a video tour. Of the, of the property. Another important part is the tabs that we've created here. So you have a summary, investment, financial. So you have a complete summary of, of the property, or, or you could get into the nitty gritty of it as well. So permits is one of the really cool things. If you want to see if the in-law unit is permitted, you can get in your car, go to the county, wait in line, or you can just click permits here. Your choice, right? Streamlined. <laughs> and, and another thing that we thought was really important is to be able to have this 
application work for you as well. So if you really want to go to the open house, add the open house to your calendar here. You can email, print, export, or even add this agent to your contact list or even share it on Facebook. And another important thing that went through multiple iterations is this, finance, is this financial forecast. This financial forecast was massaged a lot and we, we created a high, high level report, but now the report can be manipulated by investors as well. So they can manipulate the numbers to see the true outcomes of what possibly could happen with this um, property. And then that being said, I'll give it back to Kathy. Hey, thanks, Thank Amir. you. <laughs> So to sort of um, to sum up all the great stuff that Mir said, and this is my shout out to come visit us because the prototype is pretty dope in real life. Uh, all these data points are designed to help you as an investor, whether it's your very first uh, investment property or your 100th, excuse me, 100th, to make a decision <coughs> super quickly and with great confidence. Uh, so trusted data, understood quickly and easy to act on. But let's get back to Ann and Paul. They're kind of the stars of this and really our inspiration in making this very human-centric. At the start of this project, we really wanted to understand what are the pains that investors feel? What are their frustrations? And what can we do to design a solution to make life better for them? We showed them design, and that was the round of user testing that I mentioned, and we asked them for their feedback so we can make the prototype even better. And this is what they had to say. Again, these are real quotes. This tool would would replace five other tools that I use. I look through thousands of listings a day and this criteria match will save me a lot of time. And then finally, the most important thing is that you're showing me the data that I chase down. So that's pretty meaningful for us. Coming out of this user testing, we really want to validate the validity of the design. Were we really accomplishing the goal that we had set out to do? And we feel confident that we did for the time being. There's always more you can do, but we feel good about what we've done. And that we can bring enormous value to real estate investors through this prototype. However, I think the bigger picture here is that we created something that opens up real estate investment as an opportunity for everyone. So while we feel confident that this tool will make the investment easier for people who are in the game, we're saying that now it's accessible to people who are not the desire to. And with that, I'll conclude to say thank you. And if you have any questions, we're happy to answer them. to come up and say thank you for all of the work. These capstone partners really do put in a lot of work in, um, in working with our students. I hope that you get a lot of benefit out of it as well. Absolutely. But thank you. Absolutely. And uh, Blake, you can now ask your question while we're setting up for uh, Catalia. Yes, yeah, so first I just want to say actually
Keep, keep going, everyone. Um, our next group is Battaglia Health. This is another uh, returning sponsor, so we're very happy to have great kid here, um, who also hired one of our alums, so Stacey Saronic is also here from Battaglia Health. <laughs> Um, so for the rest of you capstone sponsors, feel free to hire them. Uh, no. Uh, so thank you so much to this team. We're excited to see what they're doing iterating um, on home health care and robotics. Awesome. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I want to echo what Shilpa said earlier, thanking you for giving up your Friday afternoon to us. And um, we're not just coming for free lunch. So thank you for hanging in and making it to this late in the day. Um, I'm Michelle Chin, and we are Team Toba. And our client, as Jillian said, is Catalia Health. So I'll be handling the introduction to Catalia Health in Mabu. Jeff will walk you through um, phase one, discovery, and Calvin will walk you through phase two, ideation and validation. So we worked primarily with Corey Kidd and Linda Moyer for the first 15 weeks or so of this 20 week engagement. <coughs> And then Stacey Saronic from cohort one, who also had Catalia Health for her capstone around this time last year, joined their team in August. She was a welcome addition and added some much needed guidance and insight for our project. Um, on our team, we have Calvin Lin, we have Jeff Chen, we have Yongri Kim, and myself. So a little bit about Catalia Health. Um, their mission is to help chronically ill patients who have been recently released from the hospital better adhere to their care plans so they don't end up returning to the hospital. Um, there's a lot of cost um, and inefficiencies associated with people having to be returned patients and we want people to stay healthy and in their homes. Um, they aim to catalyze lasting behavior changes for patients wherever they are by providing patients with the encouragement and motivation to achieve the best possible medical outcome. And a little bit about our friend Mabu, our friendly robot, robotic companion. Um, she's a personal healthcare companion. She helps people um, engage with their own treatment. She provides, uh, she's provided the patients through their insurance or healthcare provider to help them manage their chronic illnesses. In a randomized controlled clinical trial, patients using her platform were engaged 40% longer than patients using just a computer. Um, years of psychological studies have confirmed that people are more likely to, uh, tr to trust, remember, and form bonds with people when they're interacting with a person over a mediated interface. The same holds true for technology. And Catalia Health has built their technology to increase this effect. Maybe with an effective, scalable technology platform that uses facial recognition and AI-driven conversation that are tailored to each patient. So in our spring intensive back in March, Corey presented two potential project focus areas for us to extend Mabu's capabilities. Um, because as a standalone little robotic friend, you're kind of limited to when you're at home and interacting with her. Um, so um, our choices were to explore telehealth or a health portal. We chose the health so our rationale behind choosing the healthcare portal was to extend Mabu's capabilities. We thought that that was really important at this stage in, in Mabu's introduction to the world because we, we didn't want people to be limited to just what they could interface with at home, whether she's on your nightstand or your counter, um, what have you. Um, in Mabu's current state, she prompts the conversation and sends those answers back to the care team. But if there's a need for a patient to update information, um, enter multiple additional medications, or um, track their health data such as weight or blood pressure, there isn't a way to do that. So we really wanted to provide that ability to create this 360 experience for patients interact interacting with Catalia Health's platform. Um, we also wanted a method to allow patients to stay connected when they're away from their main companion. companions. So, you know, as we know, like to travel, right? And so, you know, if you're somebody suffering from chronic illness and you're going to go visit your daughter or your family, like it may not be feasible to pack Mabu in your suitcase. So 
So our approach used the double diamond approach. And beginning in spring, with the problem statement, we wanted to validate the need for the portal in itself. Like, is this something that people are really going to use, or is this just an idea that we came up with? Um, and we wanted to understand what the portal landscape looked like, understand best practices around healthcare portals, um, and define what our scope would look like. Um, because in 20 weeks, it, time goes by really quickly. Um, so in summer, we moved forward into ideation, iteration, prototyping, testing, and refinement until we came up with a solution. Now I'll hand it over to Jeff to talk about phase one. Cool. Thank you, Michelle. So I'll walk you through our research and recommendations. So we did a, a whole lot of different types of research. Um, there are basically two big areas. One is about understanding the sort of the space, the domain knowledge, so getting domain knowledge. We, uh, we did a lot of, we look at a lot of existing research, understanding the work that's been done today, whether it's like Catalia's works or works done by the previous cohort. Uh, we also look at a lot of industry insights by reviewing white paper and publications. Also did some heuristic evaluations and competitive analysis to understand the, the landscape better. Uh, the second big category was about understanding uh, our users better. So we did uh, a combination of quantitative and qualitative research which uh, I'll walk you through here more in depth. Um, first thing first was uh, we did a quantitative survey. Uh, we, we got about 77 um, respondents, uh, all suffer from chronic disease. About 90% of them take multiple medications per day, so it's very relevant. Um, a, a one third of them for, mentioned that at some point they have forgotten to take their medications as directed. About 45% already communicate with their care team via email or a healthcare portal. So this tells us instead of creating something new from scratch, uh, we need to create something that's familiar with our user, that's you know, the way they live in understanding their use case, understanding their current workflow, and coming up with something that's familiar. Want to just share one quote that came up from our one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one interviews. Um, so one participant, Chris, uh, when asked if she hears from her care team, uh, her response is, do they call me? Actually, they don't. It's up to me to call if, if, or if anything has changed. They don't call to check on me. We've got a lot of interesting quotes like this. And so we're looking for patterns and looking for themes. The general themes that emerged were uh, stress, medications, adherence, and communications with the care team. A um, couple interesting ones I'll read out loud here. I have a lot of stress and remember, remembering my pills adds to that stress and being stressed makes my condition worse. Um, or usually once a week or so, I forgot my second dose of medications. So from the, all the research that we've done to understand the domain knowledge and understanding our users, we basically um, saw a pretty equal, interesting 50-50 split in the way our users uh, use technology. So the first group is what we call the independent skeptic. Uh, they're a no-nonsense DIY person who wants quick and easy access to their healthcare info. Uh, they skew more to using a desktop or laptop, right? The second group uh, tend to be a little bit more open-minded. We call them open-minded explorer. Users who are willing to explore new technology and form a personal bond with their healthcare providers. Uh, they may be casual gamers and are more likely to use a tablet or smartphone. Some keywords um, that um, we came up with uh, to help us just kind of uh, keep these two groups um, top of mind through, throughout the process. Uh, so familiarize, differentiate, and communicate for the first group. Um, again, work, they just want to get the work done uh, with the way that they're familiar with um, uh, today. Uh, the second group, uh, promote, educate, inspire, and excite. So you see these groups are more like, they're more receptive towards new ideas they're uh, open to receive t tips and insights and uh, guidance along the way. So when it comes to our recommendations and our strategy, uh, we want to basically be able to support both user groups uh, given the equal distributions. And instead of creating a new app, uh, which seemed like an obvious solution, uh, we wanted a solution, we wanted our solutions to be basically device and platform agnostic. Uh, so we decided to take a responsive web approach and start with uh, desktop web, uh, which most of our users are more familiar with. Now I'll hand over to uh, Calvin to talk about our actual design. All right. Thank you, Jeff. We'll take you through phase two of our designs. 
Um, taking all our research from phase one, we began sketching, creating site maps, and organizing our thoughts for visual artifacts, as you can see. Um, this phase of design ideation can be challenging when stakeholders are in the same room, but can be, can be made even more challenging when communicating remotely. Um, as you can see, we quickly moved into higher fidelity prototypes. Uh, the main focus of our patient portal was to allow the patient to quickly view and check their vitals edit their complex medication list and schedule, and communicate with their care provider. Um, we went with a modular design, which allowed for easy modification in the future, and then with some feedback to Patalia Health, and a few iterations, we moved on to our user testing. During our user testing, um, we conducted unmoderated remote usability testing uh, through usertesting.com, and our participants were six people between the ages of 41 and 67, um, with three women and three men. They represented a spectrum of health conditions from a healthy 46-year-old mother who is caring for a child with chronic illness to a 67-year-old woman who creates her own spreadsheets to track her <coughs> blood pressure over time. And overall, the feedback was very positive. Um, the most common critical feedback we received um, involved the use of our terminology and expectation for a new message function. And this is our final iteration. So after addressing issues from user testing and, and, <coughs> and accessibility issues, we came up with our final iteration. Um, our final design encompasses three main fu functions, the dashboard, the medications, and the messages function. The dashboard provides an overview and insight of the user's blood pressure, weight, medication use, and symptoms. In the medications tab, the user can edit their medications and their schedule. See from the video. And then the messages function um, that allows the users to communicate uh, with their healthcare provider. Alright, so where do we move on from here? Um, in our current design, we have an easy to use product in which users can easily view their records and communicate with their care providers. To further refine our product in the future, we will start testing with actual MAVE users um, to cater to their specific needs and build upon theirs. Um, our modular design allows Katara Health to easily make changes and add features in the future. Um, moving on, um, maybe we would need to build a provider portal uh, for the care providers to monitor and access patient information. We can view our uh, full prototype at our table after the presentation. And we are Team Tomo, and thank you for your time. focus on gaming and virtuality and um, children. So,
Hi everyone, I'm very excited to tell you about how we've been working with our partner to really change the hospital experience for young children. We are Team Game Changers, and my name is John, and today I have with me... Today I have with me myself. Does, does anyone know, okay, so what? is blue, but smells like red paint. Blue paint, thank you. Yes. <laughs> I think we have time for another one. Okay. What did the fish say to the brick wall? Fish. Yes, damn. <laughs> As I mentioned, my name is John, and I have with me our team, uh, Shreya, Gary, Maria, Miyuki, and Joyce. We've been working with our partner over the last two quarters, uh, Jared, who's the Vice President of Product at SOP, Nate, who's the Director of Patient Technology and Innovation, and today we have Michael, who is our Vice President of Marketing and here today. So, in the hospital, after visiting hours are over, the only thing left to keep you company is a hospital TV. It's far away, it's not engaging, and it's certainly not personalized in any way. If you're a child in the situation, it's an even more challenging situation. Sure, there are alternatives like YouTube, but YouTube is an untamed garden of content that's not right for kids in a lot of situations. Our partners, our founders of Game Changers Charity, Jim and Taylor Carroll founded a charity to leverage technology and really change the patient experience. They've been working for about 10 years directly with families and patients, and what they've come to conclude is we need a dedicated platform to serve this population. Kids have very unique needs. And that platform is Zot. So Zot is a content, curated content library, age-appropriate music, videos, dedicated game servers, live streams from YouTubers and Twitch celebrities, as well as broadcasts of hospital events. Often kids in isolation are unable to attend events, so this is a really great way to keep them connected. And lastly, clinical and educational content, and a really great chat feature where you can talk to other kids in your hospital and others. So with all that in mind, we started to think, what direction should we take? Our first question are for Zots users. Obviously, patients. Parents as over-the-shoulder or indirect users, and caregivers. Caregivers as really administrative or back-end users. So a lot of time and attention is being spent at Zot at, with patients and with parents. Caregivers could use some love and attention. So we thought that's a great opportunity to improve Zot's adoption. What I'm showing you here is a content management system that caregivers log into to edit and manage content, as well as add any great content that they see fit for their patients. Now, this flow is a little bit complicated. It's a homegrown system, and it could definitely uh, use a little bit of improvement. So we thought this would be a great direction for us. Let's improve the content management's usability, and in turn, get more people engaged with more amazing content into this platform. Our next initial phase of research was talking to these caregivers. These are the folks that we want to serve. It might not be surprising to, to learn that hospitals are a busy place. Each time a family checked in or was a new patient, our caregivers had to introduce what's up, what is the value. That's an enormous time burden and it simply would burn out anyone. We also found that when parents use Zot, that their children were much more likely to pick up the platform and continue to use it throughout their stay. Caregivers did not have the time oftentimes didn't feel like they had the right training or ultimately weren't sure there was even their job to introduce such a technology to families. We would help caregivers by helping Zot introduce itself. Great. So, we realized
realized that we needed to actually think about what type of impact we wanted to pr produce with the type of research we were doing. We realized we wanted to take a step back at this point and think about how do we increase engagement with SOFT. So we shifted our focus to actually parents because we realized that educating parents would increase engagement with Zod and in return also increase engagement with patients. So with the parents, the current challenge right now was that they were over the shoulder users of Zod. They didn't have a good idea of what their child patient was actually doing in the hospital using Zod. The direction we wanted to go towards was actually creating um, an experience for parents so that they could become a larger presence in Zot, which would in, in turn engage the patients. So how did we do this? We decided to do some foundational research. So there's going to be a lot of research coming up ahead. We started out by talking to, parent, you know, to parents. We talked to parents who had previously had children in hospitals, and we found out things that were both surprising and unsurprising. Things that were surprising to us were that normal family rules, specifically around time management and time control, did not apply in hospital settings. Things that weren't as surprising to us, and maybe to you as well, were that parents want safety for their children and what they, what they engage in. Additionally, we also found out that parents want, to, want an ability to monitor the type of content that their children view. Alongside doing these user interviews, we also conducted expert interviews, as well as looked at past literature. There are a lot of research papers around this topic, and so we felt that it might have been a missed opportunity if we didn't look at already conducted research around this. So one of the insights around this was around joint media engagement. And there's this idea that basically children who interact